has it's a very theological level to believe day that you've ever heard of. Thank you all for joining us tonight for the uh, virtual reception for uh, the Wonder um, online exhibition. I'm Hamida Glasgow, the director and curator at the Center for Fine Art Photography. And I'm really excited to um, hear from the artist tonight and hear from Douglas uh, about how he selected the show and, and the selections. Um, the idea behind the show was really about um, sort of in some ways going back to the basics, like photography is about I got muted. Okay. I don't know where I left off. Was I mute the whole time when I was moving? Was I moving? Okay. <laughs> uh, I was sort of saying that, you know, the, 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 going back to the beginning, the idea is, um, about wonder is, you know, photography in a lot of ways is about what we give our attention to and what we, you know, what we're attracted by, what compels us, what catches our eye. And so um, it was sort of going back to the beginning. The idea was sort of going back to that beginning of photography. Um, but also just, um, you know, these days, the news is just so overwhelming. Um, it was also the idea of like, you know, what gives a joy? What is, you know, what are the joys in life? And it's so much about, for me anyway, and for a lot of people, the, this idea of wonder, like of, you know, looking at something with that, you know, the, 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 um, the idea of awe and, and those are the times I think that make life special. Uh, it's the little moments, but it's also those moments of wonder. And so that was the idea behind the show. Um, and um, and then we were so happy when when Douglas McCullough agreed to 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 be the juror for the show, um, and we knew we were gonna it was gonna be a great show. Um, so we do still have people joining us, but Douglas, if you would like to just talk a little bit about um, sort of your overall whether the jurying process or your overall impression of the show, and if there's you know specific images that. Um, you know, really speak to you or that you wanted to talk about, that would be great. Yeah, sure. I'll jump in. So um, Doug McCullough, I'm, I'm a senior curator at the California Museum of Photography, which is the uh, photography museum of the University of California. So I'm sort of in the belly of the beast of the University of California and have had a lifetime in photography, essentially. Um, first off, it, you know, it's an absolute honor to be a juror for a show like this, but also specifically this show, Wonder. It is like going back to the to the kind of roots, and I I feel honored because I realize that people arrive kind of um, bearing their treasures. You know, I've spent years on this project. I these are like my children. You know, and so. I honestly kind of come in with a certain degree of wonder, yeah, but like kind of honor and reverence about that. And what what I, I just a few um, general observations, and then maybe a few specific things is that what's totally fantastic about reviewing a you know a vast sweep of images like this, where there's literally you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of images in this pool is it really underlines what an interesting moment it is for photography. Um, I think photography has mutated and changed throughout its history at a high velocity. It's done nothing but change technologically, conceptually, in every other way. But at the moment, you know, I, I, I kind of went back to, there's a critic, Rosalind Krauss, who wrote a paper sometime in the late 60s about sculpture in which she talked about the expanded field of sculpture, which at that time was like, okay, it's no longer a statue in a, in a gallery. People were casting aside what they called purity and embracing any approach that worked. So you ended up at that point, and her paper talks about in sculpture, you have minimalism, you have land art, you, you know, you have literally Christo wrapping things, um, light and space artists here in California where I am, or somebody walking a line in the desert as sculpture. I mean, the expanded field 
is the idea. And I've always loved that phrase. So I kind of look at photography now and go, God, are, are we in an expanded field or what? So part of going back to the original motivation for photography, the kind of wonder that, you know, oh my God, what Chris Burden, a great artist said, uh, um, art is really a pointing activity. I think this is beautiful. I think this is important. I'm going to point you at it. And I've always loved that. So, but the technological ways of getting there are in this expanded field. So in the pool of you artists are, you know, people you've, you've seen, there's Photoshop, there's camera phones, there's apps, there's this incredible circulation instantaneously on the internet. And now there's AI, you know, really everybody trying to struggle and figure out like, what does that mean? Is this post photography? Is this photography? What is this? Um, and so the, the field has really just expanded dramatically. And that's underlined by looking through all the wonderful stuff that shows up and is in this show. So one more comment about that. <laughs> I try and limit this to a reasonable amount of time is that it's totally great to watch artists respond to that. You know, it's actually a wonder to see artists respond to the fact that now the possibilities are limitless. Some people embrace every edge and every change. Other people like fiercely reject it and say, I'm only going to shoot film. I'm only going to make black and white prints. I'm not going to burn or dodge. I'm going to show the full frame. And, you know, some embrace AI. I mean, the range of responses is huge too. Me, I kind of love the whole shaggy beast. You know, I, I'm uh, the, I'm in more in the cast aside, the purity. I don't really care how you get there. But what I finally really do care about as a curator, as a photo person is, what is this photograph doing? What does it mean? What does it mean? How is it active in the world? How does it represent you as an artist? Like what, what does it mean? Like what's underneath it? I, um, there's a, I have a, a quote, a photo quotations.com, a website of photo quotations I've collected from my like whole life. And so I love photo quotes. There's a really great one by Robert Heineken who taught at UCLA for years. And he said, the photograph is not a picture of something. It's an object about something which gets to that meaning thing. The photograph is not a picture of something, it's an object about something. I love that, it's like, okay, it, it, it I mean, that really kind of cuts to the heart of it. And there's a, that's the wonder of it in the end, is, you know, Susan Sontag talked about that images, these photographs thicken our world, they make it modern, they thicken our world. And then there's a Robert Adams, the great photographer from Colorado, um, or, you know, spent a lot of time in Colorado. The, the final strength in really great photographs is that they suggest more than what they show literally. And that finally, to me, is the wonder of photography, is you've got this connection between the tangible and the intangible. And the, there's the visible, which is maybe some portion of which is in the photograph. And then there's the completely unseen, the layers underneath it. And so in the end, talking in this sort of abstract manner, I ended up making selections on this kind of basis. And you people who are, you know, on the screen and have, are gonna show work are finally like, wow, look at all the beautiful layers here. Look at the wonder in it. Look at the, the, the tangible, visible object, but look what's, underneath it, look what it means. So there you go. That's Those are my comments about this show. Great show, an honor. Thank you, wonderful. Um, so uh, Dominique Munoz um, is going to speak about his work first. He was, um, Douglas gave him the his juror selection. So Dominique, it's all yours. Hi everyone. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, I first wanna say thank you to Douglas for selecting me for the award. Um, I really, really was appreciative of receiving that. And thank you, Hamida, for as well, the director's mention. Um, well, thank you. 
Um, I'm going to go ahead and share the screen. Can everyone see this full screen? Yeah. Beautiful. Yes. Okay. Sorry, I was like, this thing is a little bar is weird. Um, yeah, so my name is Dominique Munoz, and the piece on the left is called Self-Portrait as a Peacock, and this is the piece that was selected for the exhibition. Let me go ahead and go through a little bit of my work, tell you a little bit about how I got here. Um, a lot of my photographs are grounded in environments that are reminiscent of my childhood memories, supercharged with imagination, places that fissure reality, allowing the spirituality of my ancestors to trickle through. I'm experimenting a lot with esoteric and naturalistic rituals, thinking about the, mystic the mysticism of my Mesoamerican ancestors. Domestic spaces are a huge inspiration in my life. Family photographs have always been part of my surroundings ever since I could remember. The matrix of my family curated their homes in ways that I couldn't understand, yet I appreciate appreciated their existence. Frames hung from odd heights, little shrines glowed on random surfaces, and green foliage bloomed. The creative, my, the creative well of my exploration begins here in these domestic spaces. Each shell is the Mayan name for the moon, the goddess of medicine. In the spring of 2021, my grandma spent a week in the hospital recovering from a severe abdominal pain. That same week, each shell came her closest to the earth, a super moon. My grandma and I stood on her apartment balcony, gazing over the neighborhood pool and my childhood playground. When Ishelle reached her brightest, we draped our family's emerald green blanket over the handrail to begin our ritual. This blanket has been with our family for two generations, a symbol of Guatemala for me. My grandmother raised, rested her right hand on the plush threads and stood in silence, channeling the moonlight, rejuvenating her ability to rescalar. I, I continued collaborating with my grandma by making portraits of her around her neighborhood. The shawl that you see in this image is wrapped around here is a traditional Guatemalan textile has various uses such as gathering fruits and vegetables, um, covering her body and also carrying a baby. And my gr grandmother specifically used this to carry me in when I was younger. In 2022, I quit my job as an in-house commercial photographer in Washington, DC and moved out to Laramie, Wyoming with my partner so he could pursue his MFA in creative writing. During my two years in Wyoming, I revisited old images and created new work, building a portfolio I could send out for grad school applications. I started playing with self-portraiture and treating my images as a type of thread that I could physically weave back into each other. Last fall, I began, began my MFA program in studio art here at UNC Chapel Hill, gaining resources and mentorship to help push my experimentation with photography. This is um, kind of an exploration of installation and looking at archival family images and images that I also photographed in my family's neighborhood. My current body of work, I deconstruct photographs, collaging them together to build photographic objects and wallpaper. Strips of inkjet paper weave in and out, obscuring my portraits with armor. The textures of my work originate from childhood blankets. With backdrop stands and strobes, I photograph these textiles as a method to conjure and honor the spirits of my Guatemalan matriarchs. The woven masks in my work symbolize the constriction I experienced navigating masculinity as a queer Latino child. The threads of these portraits extend beyond the canvas, challenging the borders of the self. I treat this disruption as an invitation for the audience to explore the depths of their own identities. Um, these are some detail shots of the actual piece. So kind of similar to what Douglas was saying earlier, it's, I've been trying to push a lot of what is a photograph or what's like pushing out of the 2D space and thinking about how photography is used and Last semester, I was reading a lot about just the idea of like energy bouncing off of objects and light particles bouncing off and cameras capturing those. And so I started just going in and capturing family blankets that I gathered from around my house and thinking about ways or at least the people who were touching these and specifically my mother, my grandmother and my great grandmother. My great grandmother is no longer with us. And so by photographing the blankets, I felt that I could still conjure her spirit and bring her into these portraits. And similar to what Doug was saying, like showing this invisible spirit in these images. The peacock for me also has a symbolic element of um, masculinity, spe specifically the more feminine looking ones. Um, they are the most like colorful and their plumage is just much more vibrant. 
Um, so I thought that was really interesting and adorning the peacock from one of my childhood blankets, the same one that I used in an earlier image with my grandma resting her hand on, um, bringing that into these images almost as a turning myself into a deity in a way um, and using the mask again to symbolize that constriction of masculinity. I continued some from these strips of paper that were left over from this. I actually ended up creating this wallpaper as well, weaving them together, scanning them in, and they were building out this pattern wallpaper. And I call this piece performance for a camera as a baby, thinking about these similar ideas of performing for cameras in these like studio spaces, like JCPenney pop-up image uh, studio shops, um, and having to perform masculinity as a kid being forced to wear these outfits that I really had no control over or opinions on whether I liked them or not. Um, here's some detailed images of those adorned against the backdrops. Um, and then continue pushing um, collage techniques by printing, cutting myself out from these images, putting them against actual the blanket themselves, but they maybe this time in this image, at least it's the reverse side of the blanket and allowing the light to create depth and build out another type of portrait or another version of myself by just using the textures and the textiles of the blanket. Uh, being in grad school has allowed me to as well, like expand the scale that I'm working in. And so this um, is probably one of my biggest pieces I've done. It's about 60 by 50 inches suspended by oak hangers that I made. Um, and this is my grandmother using similar weaving techniques and thinking about other blankets and how those are charged and using them as thread to weave back in and create these different types of armor on her and what those represent in my across other family members. But thank you for your time. How do I stop sharing? There you go. Thank you all. That was wonderful. Thank you. So fantastic. Um, I have questions, but I'm going to hold them till the end. Um, let's see. Um, so Jason is going to go next. Jason, are you ready? Jason, I gave Jason my director's award. I am ready. Oh, there you are. Sorry, I was like, where is where is he on the, the grid? <laughs> Wonderful. One moment. Hey everyone, can uh, can you see that? It's um, it's working on it. There we go. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank Amita uh, and Douglas for including me in this incredible show, and of course for um, awarding me the director's award. I'm really humbled and honored by that. Um, <clears throat> uh, so tonight I'm going to walk you through my last four bodies of work um, and kind of talk about how I, my process and how my ideas have evolved through the last 10 or so years. Um, so about 10 years ago, I moved to Michigan uh, to teach photography at Eastern Michigan University. Um, I got married, I bought my first home in a small 1950s subdivision in Ann Arbor. Um, and with this life change, I found myself paying a lot more attention to things like landscaping, gardening, and the way my neighbors chose to craft their natural surroundings. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a frog, so. Um, it was around this time, um, I was also accepted into the Vermont Studio Center for an artist residency. Um, and I wasn't quite really sure what I was going to do. So in preparation, I did a lot of reading on environmental management trends, the politics of human wildlife relationships, uh, mass extinction phenomena, as well as the history of coevolution with plants. Um, I also began collecting and photographing plants from my neighbor's gardens. And I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do with these images. Um, but I wanted to make sure that I had a lot of source material to get me through the residency. It was around this time as well that I started experimenting with photographing birds on bird feeders with lights and remote triggers. 
And in my previous work, I'd worked with animals before, but they had all been taxidermied. Um, so I'd been talking about um, a relationship to the environment, but using sort of artificial animals. And so this was the first time I was using real animals and the most accessible animals uh, in my neighborhood were birds. So this is the first piece I made in a residency called Cowbirds and Cake Sprinkles. Um, and I was inspired to recreate these uh, domestic scenes that I've been seeing in my neighborhood while also alluding to the sort of overtly manufacturedness of those spaces. I was also interested in using this pair of cowbirds to represent the domestic relationship. This, late, uh, this piece would later become um, part of a series called Confected, um, and the word being a combination of infected and confection. Uh, this piece is called Goldfinch Pink Cord. Um, and as I mentioned, I was becoming increasingly interested in the co-evolution of humans, plants, animals. And after reading The Botany of Desire by Michael Pollan, I became fascinated by the idea that plants could and have used us to propagate and flourish. So um, I started looking at the history of genetically modifying plants to look better and our cultural desire to improve on nature. So with this series, I'm commenting on that cultural desire to idealize the natural world and I'm exploring this veneer of material desire and constructed natural beauty by creating fictional tableaus to speak of a state of disenchantment. So this idea of improved is important as it's used as the same model for marketing products, bigger, brighter, sweeter, more colorful, new, improved. Um, to me, um, the birds in the work act as observers. They look back at the viewer and invite contemplation, but they're also perfectly adapted for the sort of new mashed up commercial world they find themselves in. And I'm, at, I'm interested in that, in having those animals act as surrogates for our domestic roles. So the, I feel like they sort of mirror our own suburban existence, apathetically surrounded by false beauty and product. This piece is titled Corn Syrup Summer. And I was experimenting with um, <clears throat> this piece, pouring corn syrup over the plants to emulate rain or dew. And I like the way it sort of reflected light, this sort of luscious, indulgent candy-like coating to the plants. But I also liked how that could sort of reference GMO corn, the modification or the improvement of food. Um, so by improving the natural elements with lighting and photography, um, these objects once found in nature are now treated more like commercial goods. A couple of years later, I did another residency in Vermont because it was so great, I had to go back. Um, and I started a new series called Adorn. And sort of, as you can see, building off the confected work, I was really interested in pushing this idea of decadence um, and expanding on the detail and complexity of the work. This work is a bit darker, I would say, than, um, and my process had become a lot more involved. For each piece I'm shooting up to, or for each um, element, I'm shooting up to 20 uh, images per piece. And then I focus stack all of that to make sure everything is sharp from front to back. So each image ends up having literally hundreds of images within it. Um, this particular piece is titled Vanilla Sky. And for this one, I raised uh, silk moth from eggs, which took over a year to complete the process. So rather than using stock photos, this allows me to photograph the subject at different stages and be able to capture that fleeting moment when the moth is emerging from the cocoon. There's a few studio images uh, of the Cecropia moth. And if you've never seen these, the caterpillars are amazing. They have um, like this rainbow colored spikes running down the back of their 
back that look almost like little pieces of candy. Uh, here you can see on the left, um, the caterpillar. And this ended up uh, as part of a repeatable wall mural I had uh, in a show in Detroit. This piece is titled After the Deluge. And here, um, the deluge is a shower of Home Depot paint that I color matched to the um, peony stems that I had purchased. Um, as you can see, the work's getting a little darker. I was interested in creating more of a, a tension between that sort of romantic beauty of the dramatic vanilla skies, and then in this case, the paint drenched finch that's sitting on the flower. Um, I think all of the work in this series points to a tension between disaster and beauty. And I would say that for all of my work, really. Um, it gets, this one in particular gets its title um, from the historic painting of George Frederick Watts, which depict the sky after the story of Noah's flood. Um, and I was interested in this idea of cleansing after a time of immorality and the sort of tension in representing that aftermath. Also, of course, um, I liked how the story of the flood plays into the role of climate change and ri rising sea levels. So I see the work as sort of a, a fictitious aftermath from an overindulgent culture gone awry where the world's been so impregnated with our goods that it's become part of its very fabric. Uh, this is another uh, wallpaper I did, and um, this was uh, done in an effort to sort of push this idea of opulence and overindulgence. This was an installation at the University of Michigan Museum of Art, um, where I hung this repeatable wallpaper around the entire octagonal room, um, which spanned over 80 linear feet. So I really wanted people to feel overwhelmed with this sort of visual gluttony. So in the summer of 2019, I received a sabbatical um, to, to travel to Costa Rica for two months to work on a new body of work. I was directly responding to the work of 19th century Hudson River School painter, Martin Johnson Heed, um, whose image is here. Uh, and his series of sort of romantically inspired paintings focusing on tropical birds um, from Central and South America, namely orchids and hummingbirds. So during my sabbatical, I lived in various cabins in the forest of Costa Rica, um, working to create images that included elements from each habitat that I visited. Um, and I was interested in manipulating this historical romantic representations of these places by injecting contemporary elements that suggest ideas surrounding climate change, land use, um, the history of naturalism. Here's an image of one of my mobile setups uh, to photograph hummingbirds. So here's the first piece I made of this series. Um, and part of what attracted me to Heed's work was the way that he could represent nature as a sort of raw and foreboding element. I, I embraced that darkness in the work and I was interested in referencing this era of naturalism that portrayed nature as untamed and mystical, the source of power, um, but also contrasting that with our modern almost micromanagement of this world. This piece is titled Mountain Gems and Gummy Worms. If you look closely, you can see gummy worms um, on the branch there. In many of these, I'm including a volcano in the background to place tension in these seemingly quiet, seductive scenes. Again, that idea of um, referencing apathy in light of impending destruction. So during this time, I was also photographing for a second series I later called Tangential. And with this series, I'm revisiting that, that visual gluttony that um, I was looking at in Adorned um, by creating these sort of hypothetical dystopias that reflect the precarious position we're faced with now with political unrest, 
late stage capitalism, and of course, climate change. Um, one thing I haven't mentioned is my desire to use the photograph. Um, I, I want the work to feel as truthful as possible in order to sort of connect it back to its original source. Um, therefore, I do, I do very little in the way of altering um, the original image. I, I piece them together, but I don't really do a lot of editing Photoshop work on them because I want the work to feel authentic and not overly Photoshopped. Um, I, especially now, I feel like that's really important um, in the age of AI where we're seeing a lot of this kind of fantastical work. Um, I want that work to have the sort of grain of truth to it. This piece, Dove's Delusion, which appears in the show, uh, features bubble tape dripping from pink uh, musienda flowers. And as you can see, the compositions are becoming more complex in their visual density. And this is done in an effort to have the work feel almost suffocating. Um, I want that tension between seduction and discomfort. I'm also um, paying close attention to color, creating these sort of impossible color connections in the work to allude to marketing or design or management. Here, um, I'm using the sort of universal color scheme for fast food. This piece is titled Cellophane Cacique. And I'm responding to the reality that um, we're learning now that much of our world is contaminated with microplastics. So the universal blue plastic shopping bag here, sort of hidden in the foliage, um, I wanted to make this invisible visible. <clears throat> you can see that reference here again with the plastic bottle caps. For this image, I photographed these grackles uh, one day in Costa Rica when I was actually taking the afternoon off to lay at the beach. And the birds were waiting for people to leave so that they could clean up any scraps or trash left behind. And it struck me how these animals had perfectly adapted to our incursion into their own world. So in this last piece, I'm um, extending that idea of scavenging. This diptych titled King's Reverie um, portrays three king vultures um, by matching, uh, that are matched with colored ribbon candy waiting patiently for this sort of uncertain future. Thank you. Fantastic. So I, I just love hearing all the um, ideas behind the work and, and the way that you think about, uh, you know, what you think about and the way you think about things as you're making them. It's just, it's just delightful. Um, and Donja um, Burris is next. Yeah, there we go. Hi, everyone. All right, so I have a brief presentation because this series that I was calling Encounter, it really only consists of three composite images. This one, thank you. Anza, you're not yet sharing your screen. Oh, no? No, you might have pushed the button, but uh, but maybe it didn't actually go there yet. Well, thank you for prompting me. There you, you go. Me? All right, there we go. Thank you. I, um, I guess you heard what I began with. Um, short presentation I'll do centered around this one image that was selected. Thank you, thank you, and, and congratulations. And I'm happy to be in such company of everyone's work in this, in this show. When I saw the call um, with the title and saw the call coming from the center, which I, I've come to really love the center. You've accepted another piece of mine once in Altered Landscapes. Um, I thought, well, this is exactly the realm I was residing in when I did this work that really came out of a research project. I um, have researched and taught and uh, written a not published PhD on the relationship that we hold with animals, we humans with non-human animals, and how we have tended throughout the ages to fabricate them. 
in order to be with and to be closer to and and what a um what a juxtaposition that really amounts to being actually so taxidermied animals were one of my research subjects from the get-go as well as zoo animals and thinking about immersive environments and how those sorts of recreated uh, artificial scenes we strive for and we we want to be immersed also but yet do we because then there is the glass and the barrier and all the rest in any case um i had been photographing at the american museum of natural history in new york where i lived and and worked and taught for a few decades and I was always fascinated by the, I'll talk more about the construction about of this image, but I was always fascinated with the, the wonderment and awe that we all seem to have in that particular setting in most uh, large uh, American hist history museums are like this, of course, as well. There, it's, it's complete theatricality and completely constructed and quite contested, of course. There's a lot of violence in the history of acquisition and exploitation and such in the, in the acquisition of these specimens. Um, but really thinking about that kind of setting and, and what does it all mean and how did it come to be? And I did a lot of reading and research into, you know, the actualities of the funding, the commissioned um, expeditions, right, to acquire acquire, i.e. hunt, kill, and bring back and measure and document the animals, the flora and the fauna. And um, I thought, let me see what else I can find visually that can help me look for that simultaneity of what is on display contemporaneously and how did it come to be. So I had... Um, paid a visit to the archives at the Museum of Natural History and um, was able to get access to contact prints, not the actual negatives, but contact prints of many of the photographs and other documentation of the teams that went into the various areas of our own continent and others, and including um, the, the artists that were on site that took, you know, and created these scenics and then brought them back to be made inside the, the dioramas. Um, that one was from Africa, East Africa, not North America, where this particular Alaskan brown bear, two bears specimens were, were acquired. Um, the imagery from the construction of that particular diorama in the American Hall of Mammals, um, was photographed in 1941 and reveals, reveals what's concealed, right? Another uh, dogma of photography, if you will. And I thought, well, that's it. That, that's the simultaneity. How can we see that? You know, um, I don't know if, if all of you, I know I do, I look very carefully and see, well, that's artificial and that's artificial. And I say, oh, what am I talking about? It's all artificial. I mean, originally, you know, it's the, the skin and, and such is preserved, but it's all artificial. But here's the behind the scenes, you know, and there's the theatricality again. Um, and then there are all these, these clues and other research guides, you know, gift of Boone and Crockett Club. Well, does that mean Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett? And in fact, it does. Those were the homage names that the group that Theodore Roosevelt, another contested figure, patron saint almost of the American Museum of Natural History was the first president of and that exists to this day, 134 year history, promoting um, conservation through hunting, et cetera. So in any case, I thought, how can I bring these details into, now this this back of the photograph didn't make it into my, my resulting composite, but more of the unseen, you know, um, who, who wrote the notes and who was the photographer? And turns out this Charles H. Coles did much of the photography prior to the installation of this particular and others in the, the Hall of Mammals uh, diorama in 1941. And uh, 
I thought, well, okay, I, I work a lot with imagery whereby I'll photograph a scene and then I'll print it on a, a clear, transparent medium. And then I'll go to that same scene, usually a landscape, particularly an artist residency. I did at Chaco Canyon in the Four Corners area a few years back. And I'll photograph through the photograph on the transparency. Again, looking for that, that simultaneity and to try to achieve that, at least thinking about if not tangibly visible, that, that ineffable that exists between the two. So this is Photoshop, it's composited. I didn't use that technique that I do in, in much of my other work, but I thought it's important to not try to make this look real because everything's real. If you think it, if you imagine it, it's real to some extent at some moment in time as, as you experience the visual, right? So let me keep the sharp edges. Let me, let me put it as if it's layers. Layers in Photoshop is meant to be exactly that, but not, not seamless. Let's show how the, the moments in time, these, these ghosts, if you will, of some of the embedded past is still there, if only we can acknowledge and think of it. Um, so in some ways, I thought that the technique was a little bit rough, but I also thought, I'd like to see that. I'd like to know that. I'd like to not see these two moments in time separately. I'd like to see them somehow together. And, and, and I'd like to also be a little confused as to which foregrounds and backgrounds the other at, at any moment in time in, in the viewing. And so that, that really was, was my technique with it. I, I didn't turn it into um, a continued project necessarily, although I'd really like to as I, as I look back at them now. Um, there were only two others that I put together and one involved the uh, photograph of the, a gentleman here painting the scenic back at the museum, not, not in the field as such, with a photograph of a, a young boy really in awe of the, the uh, mountain goats that he's seeing in the, in the photo. And one other that again is very, very simplistic, but I also thought it, it had a power for me to, to show the two photographs of the same object, the same reanimated animals and recreated scenes, but a little off register, suggesting that isn't it all just a little off register as much as there's this striving for perfection, you know, in the filling the skin of the animal with a, a, a sculpture type um, substance and then placing and building the whole, the whole uh, scenic behind it. Isn't it all just a little off register? Um, so again, it, it was, it was, it came out of research and it's something I'd like to do much more of. I just want to take some more time and, and get some different imagery, you know, maybe get to the actual negatives where I can do something like the, the, the compositing, but shooting through a, a transparency rather than, rather than the traditional compositing in this way. Um, but once again, it, um, you know, we, and it's re-photography as well. You know, I, I come back and forth thinking, do I really adhere to that tradition or not? You know, the holding up of the scene and then there's the real, the old scene and there's the street scene behind it now. Um, I, I think it still resides in that tradition a little bit. And, you know, funny enough, as I got ready to do this tonight, I went down a rabbit hole. I thought, you know, I actually don't know who the expedition crew was that acquired those bears. I knew all about Carl Akeley and the, he, he st set up the halls at the American Museum in the first place and went to East Africa and all the documentary filmmakers and everything else. Turns out they were from Alaska. Don't know exactly who they were from, uh, which hunter, because there are many who were sent out. And uh, they were indeed though members of the Boone and Crockett Club who donated them and one, was kept by
by a member. The museum commissioned it, but said, okay, you, you can keep the one bear for yourself. This is in the heyday, you know, the, the uh, late 18th, early 19th century, when all these commissioned expeditions were sent out and it was, it, it was considered fine to have in your own home these specimens or pieces of them, you know, ashtrays made of the hooves, these kinds of things that we don't, we don't think about when, I don't think so much, we visit the carefully curated and, and they're very septic, in fact, environments that were pre presented with in the, in the diorama setting. So thank you, Donja. That was wonderful. That was the thank very end. much. Thank you too. Epiphany. Epiphany Couch, it's your turn. Hi. Hello. Um, my name is Epiphany Couch, and I'm based in Portland, Oregon. Uh, so I'll share my screen and we can talk a little bit about um, the work that was selected for this beautiful show. Um, I really did love this show. Um, in the past, I've had some work in virtual shows where I was like, that's, you know, that's a show. Um, but this this work, all of the other artwork um, was incredible. And uh, being able to to speak with Douglas um, about the work was also a, a great honor. So I don't want to take up too much time here because um, I, I put together just a, a deck about this particular work that was chosen for this show. But um, as I said, I'm, I'm based in Portland, Oregon, and I've been an artist since I was three when I defaced my mother's um, Greek mythology textbooks with um, drawings of dancing people. So um, she's very pleased now that I'm an actual artist and that <laughs> those uh, mythology books weren't um, defaced in vain. But a lot of my work um, is connected to my family. I'm very close with my family. I explore um, generational knowledge, uh, storytelling, our connection to the metaphysical, um, and I'm trained as a bookmaker and a photographer, so my work oftentimes uh, goes both into bookmaking and photography, um, collage, and um, so I'll just kind of jump into to the work, legacy. Um, here, here is the work. I typically shoot with a, a Hasselblad, a film, a square format film camera, and the, the quality is just something that I've always been very attracted to, especially for, for landscapes. So these are um, the traditional home, uh, the traditional lands of my uh, Yakima ancestors along the Columbia River. And this work really explores, you know, what it means to be given a legacy. Um, my, my family doesn't have a lot of material uh, objects from my native side, um, but what we do have is a lot of stories. So to me, those are the, the greatest legacy that we can have. So this is uh, an image of my grandmother overlaid with an image of my uncle. So kind of exploring that generational um, knowledge, um, that kind of generational transmission of knowledge. So the text reads, um, all the stories, stories, stories you tell to remind me that I am the wind. I am the wind carving, carving, carving the shape of the earth. And this is from um, a poem that I wrote about my mother. And the, the other work that was included, these are in a sense a diptych, um, Ancestral Memory. So this is the continuation of, of that same poem. Um, and it says, I am the water carving, carving, carving the shape of the earth. Uh, and this is actually a, an image of my grandmother. Um, with a, a very large fish that she caught. And I've always loved this image. I use a lot of uh, kind of family archival photos in my work. And what I love about this little image is you see all of the shadows of the people looking at her. So even though it's just her, there is this community of people around her um, represented in those shadows. So this work is really about fishing and our, our fishing rights and kind of our loss of fishing rights for um, a lot of the the land that we used to inhabit so um and then just some of the themes in general that i really like to explore in my work um, place family heritage uh, storytelling community 
the metaphysical generational knowledge, um, connection and disconnection. And I thought I'd just throw in some uh, little fun photos here. So this is where I grew up. This is Tsalashali, Tacoma, Washington. Uh, my family is uh, Spialapabsh, which is the Puyallup tribe uh, located in the Tacoma area, Yakima and Scandinavian. And we spent a lot of time outside eating. Uh, so this is me actually in the, the little, uh, I don't know, red outfit, very 80s with my awesome red socks. It's just a great outfit, really. Um, but, you know, I come from fish people on both sides, right? This like Scandinavian side, this native side that are both um, fish tribes. And so we take food very seriously. We spent a lot of time outside growing up. And that's um, very uh, prevalent in my work is both kind of the outdoors and this connection to nature and then also um, family. So. I'll just kind of end on this slide here, which this is, this is Puyallup land. This uh, is the shoreline of the Puget Sound and Tacoma, which is uh, Mount Rainier in the background. And yeah, so I just feel a really deep connection to this land and um, this connection shows up very frequently in my, wor my work. We come from the land and our language comes from the land and a lot of the stories that I was raised with um, are about land and uh, rocks and animals and kind of the interconnectedness of all things. And so that um, I hope that comes through with the work and thank you for, for joining us all here to, to give us an opportunity to share a little bit more about our work. That was lovely. Thank you so much. Um, next is Roxanne Huber. Hello. It's a lot of noise upstairs because we have three kids running around. So hopefully this goes well. I'm very excited to be here and have a chance to talk to you a little bit about my work. Thank you, Douglas, for the uh, honorable mention. And thank you, Amida, for this opportunity. I'm actually a self-taught photographer. My father is a cinematographer, and I uh, became very interested after working with him for several years as a teenager. I'm originally from the Netherlands, and I'm currently in Longmont, Colorado. So I'm going to see if I can share my screen as well. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So um, this series uh, mother, Loving in the Passage of Time, began 10 years ago now when I became a mother for the first time. And as a new mom, I quickly became exasperated that the first thing everyone would say to me was, enjoy every moment, it flies by in the blink of an eye. And this kind of comment, though well-intentioned, always evokes a, a fear of loss in me. And it's actually taken me quite a while to figure out why that was. I would just become sort of anxious and annoyed and when people would just constantly remind me that it's going to fly by um, it actually created a disconnection from the here and now and so instead of enjoying the moments with my children I became very emotionally attached to the passage of time and I still often imagine uh, my future self feeling a deep sadness for the loss of the life that I'm actually still living uh, which leads to constantly feeling pressured to be present and not miss anything. This anxiety about time passing while my kids continue to change in front of me led me into a sort of obsession with understanding the concept of time. I began researching the subject, but it wasn't until I read a book, The Order of Time, by the Italian theoretical physicist Carlo Rovelli, that I understood the nature of my own work. In the book, he writes, perhaps the emotion of time is precisely what time is for us. And when I read that, I realized that I wasn't photographing time or the passage of time as a, a document or a record, 
but rather the emotions that I was feeling as a mother in relationship to the passing of time. So making these photographs allows me to convey and bear the emotions that I experience while witnessing my children going up each day. I homeschool my kids, so we spend a lot of time together. We spend a lot of time outside. I get to spend a lot of time just being a sort of spectator to in their lives. Um, I like to watch them just be themselves and go into these um, worlds of their own. So even though these photographs are of my children, they're not really about them. They involve their childhood, but they are more of being a mother. They're not for later as much as they are for now. For me, they serve as a reminder that now is really all there is. And they really are of loving in the passage of time. So for me, taking the photographs in a way helps keep me present And this photograph is another one that was selected for the show. It's actually earlier on in the work. I believe this one was taken in 2015 um, of my first daughter. This hammock was actually um, my husband's hammock when he was a little child. And it's come all the way from Brazil. So this photograph has some family heritage. Thank you so much. It's really beautiful, Roxanne. And I think this is the last one. I'll stop sharing the screen. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you. That was beautiful. It's it's very, um, I started as a poet, so it's very poetic work and it makes it very difficult to talk too much about it because it's really a, a feeling journey for me. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Mitchell? Squire? Are you ready? I shall be. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I really appreciate an opportunity to talk to you, uh, even though I'll only um, talk about a few photographs. This is the first such uh, opening I've ever participated in sort of online. So uh, I apologize if I stumble, but I'm going to be sure to get this in under five uh, minutes. Um, my practice is um, multidisciplinary. Uh, I'm an architect. I, I'm a professor of architecture. 
uh, my practice engages um, uh, visual art in the form of sculpture, performances, drawing, and some painting, as well as uh, photography, but studies in material culture and also uh, black studies. Um, so I come to this, I come to this work, or I should, I'll say photography, um, uh, in, in an odd sort of way. I, I initiated a path in photography back in the 90s, uh, in the early 90s. And by uh, the late 90s, I had abandoned it uh, to pursue uh, professorship in architecture and to do sculpture work, material studies work, that kind of thing. And so in 2019, I, I returned to it um, and I wrote uh, a proposal for a sabbatical to, to do a series of self-portraits on the socio-sexual effects of extractive economies and the material geophysics of race. And that was to happen in 2020. But of course, 2020 was, you know, the onset of the pandemic. And so uh, that work was suspended, or at least I thought it was. Um, and I wasn't able to travel as I had intended, but I started to do the work around uh, uh, my home and around the area that I uh, live. I live in central Iowa. Um, but also the pandemic brought on a different kind of urgency for me. Uh, I really became somewhat frightened, somewhat concerned about my precarious, um, uh, I guess, precariousness as a black male within this sort of health crisis. And I was uncertain that I would make it through, to be honest. And so uh, I wanted to know whether I had began to question whether or not I had lived my life to its fullest and whether or not uh, I needed to somehow be more present and visible in things that I do as a 60 plus year old man. And so I began to turn the camera again on myself uh, as a subject. And so primarily my photography is self-portrait photography. Uh, and most of the content of that work deals with uncertainty, precariousness, and my capacity to be unmeasured, uncensored, ungovernable, and sort of carried along by a flow. Because those things, I believe, are not thought to be typical of senior Black men. We're supposed to be the group that holds it down you know, for, for the for the young'uns coming up. Uh, and I've always felt that um, while I, I do share that responsibility, that's not the sum total of my existence. I'm actually quite wild and I'm actually, I'm, I'm actually ungovernable, uh, quite, quite the opposite um, of what, what someone might think. And so I find myself also questioning whether or not um, the discipline of photography or the field of photography, uh, aside from some of the earlier, I would say, racialized uh, productions of photography about black men, I was beginning to wonder whether or not enough of us had been seen, whether or not enough of us uh, had been seen in a full way and whether or not that's always some other kind of depiction. And so my work was an attempt, has been an attempt since 2020 to sort of uh, reckon with my own uh, sense of security, as well as to contribute to um, the canon, I guess, of, of photographic images about Black men. Um, so uh, what, I, what I think I can say about this particular image, which represents, I would say, I, I think I made this last fall, um, this one I made the previous spring, and these two I made in 2020 in the fall. They, they for me, represent uh, trying to grapple with whether or not I can make provocative, never-before-seen images of senior Blackness, using myself as, as the subject. Uh, it was important to me to try to make an unprecedented 
image because I'm sort of dealing with that as a subject. So I, I guess I can I can always find images of uh, 65 year old black men that uh, uh, you know in a as I say in my artist uh, statement in a in a pharmaceutical commercial. Well, that's not me. Uh, or or <laughs> even though I use quite a few pharmaceuticals, uh, <laughs> that's not me. Uh, or or in a you know the the Samuel L. Jackson type of you know blackness or the Denzel Washington. You know I'm just a cool cool motherfucker who you're not gonna mess with, right? Uh, I can I can portray all of those things, and and I think all of those things are part of my identity. But I wanted to somehow capture a, a different part of me. And when I say unprecedentedness, I'm actually referring, uh, or at least I'm using Elaine Scarry's uh, thesis about beauty and being just, um, and, and what happens when a person comes face to face with a beautiful thing, uh, that thing becomes sacred, unprecedented, life-saving, and it incites deliberation. So I kind of want the imagery that I make to have all of those characteristics, to be remarkable, to be extraordinary, to be unparalleled, et cetera, to have never been seen before, exceptional, to allow for a kind of pleasure field perception. This image I made on my uh, uh, Hasselblad, this one on my Nikon uh, Z7, this image is 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 interesting to me. Um, I, I would hope that it's a, a never before seen image, because uh, every time I show it to someone, they say, "What is that on your head?" Uh, and I say, "That's a frozen fish. It's a red snapper." And uh, I, I took the, I recently took a large uh, print of these this image to get framed, and even the framer himself, who's seen quite a bit of my work. Uh, said, why would a person put a frozen fish on their head? <laughs> right. Um, you know, but it, it uh, there are stories behind all of this. I, I When I made this image, I was uh, clearly thinking about Lewis Hyde's text, uh, Trickster Makes This World, Mischief, Myth, and Art. And I was delighted in the story of Trickster uh, uh, and his relationship with King Fisher. You know, come, come upon King Fisher, he witnesses him fishing, uh, he says, teach me how to do that. Kingfisher is hesitant. Uh, uh, no, I'm not going to teach you how to do that. You're just going to mess things up. This is my way. This is not your way. And uh, Coyote said, well, teach me anyway. And he said, no, I won't do it. But he says, come to my house. Coyote tells Kingfisher, come to my house tomorrow. I'll fix you. I'll prove to you. I'll, I'll, I'll get fish and I'll, uh, I'll cook you a meal. Kingfisher was hesitant to come, clearly. Um, and so as he was on his way to Coyote's house, Coyote goes out and tries to fish like Kingfisher fishes. He, gaz he gathers up some twigs, wraps them, burns them in the fire, dives into the hole in the ice to um, uh, capture the fish, but misses the hole, hits the ice, and dies. King Fisher comes upon him and, and sees, sees him in pity. He, King Fisher first dives into the hole, gathers the fish, comes back out, then steps over the dead coyote a couple times and revive him for life. They go home and, and coyote explains to his wife how mad King Fisher is of him. But Coyote had did in fact catch the fish the way King Fisher did, is what he told his family. Um, and so this particular image to me, which I title Undefeated, uh, would actually have me uh, in the persona, if you will, of Coyote having caught that fish um, the way that King Fisher did. And so I'm 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 part I'm part boxer here as an undefeated sort of boxer, uh, uh, but I'm also a coyote. A lot of my, uh, pardon me. 
Oh, sorry. I was just saying we're we're uh, past time. Okay. I'm yeah. sorry. Sorry. Two images. That's it. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you. So that was that was amazing. Um, Michelle and I talked the other day, and just there, actually, I mean, with everybody, there's just so much more beyond that. I wish you could, you know, we had longer recordings of everyone. Um, so I have not been doing a great job of timekeeping, and we are over time. Um, our last um, artists um, who have five minutes are Renee West and Mark Penland. And their uh, collective or their their group is um, WPA. You ready to share your screen? Uh, you're muted. We're working on it. <laughs> All right. There Hello, everybody. I'm Mark, and this is Renee. And together we are the West Pendleton Alliance. And I'd like to thank Comita and the Center for Fine Art Photography for organizing this event and for Douglas for choosing us and awarding us an honorable mention. And also for the great interview we had last week with both of you. Very thank enjoyable. You. Thank you. So um, Mark and I have been making collages since we, I don't know, found scissors or maybe even when we started tearing paper. <laughs> but uh, we've always loved to collage and we're both photographers and we love the history of photography and have worked with all kinds of formats of cameras and Photoshop and just whatever comes along we're interested in and kind of absorb it. So when AI came around, we were like, let's do this. But we had forever been talking about a collaboration. So we decided that this project would also be a collaboration, which has been one of the most fun adventures we've ever embarked on. And so this was the image that uh, received the honorable mention. It's called Everything Everywhere. And I think we were thinking about a lot of things. All of the work in some way sort of deals with technology and uh, is made with technology. But of course, photography has always sort of absorbed uh, new technologies and evolved with them. And um, we are in this image in particular, we, we just wanted to talk about the whole world being watched and also all of our data being absorbed and uh, filtered and stored. And, you know, sometimes you think, well, who could ever find it? But it turns out they do find it when they need it, don't they? And so we wanted to have this sort of overall worldwide representation of uh, people and also people outer space and aliens and, and things like that. And then the surveillance cameras everywhere. The guy, to me, the guy sort of represents Oz. You know, he's the guy behind the con right, curtain exactly. that's controlling yeah. everything. And and um, we were thinking when we were trying to uh, prompt for a computer, we were li looking for uh, a man with his back to us that uh, was at something like an old ENIAC or something, you know, like the first computer. So we wanted something really big and and um, sort of cumbersome. And and then we just started generating all these portraits from all over the world. And I. I, we needed some way to connect them. And I, I was really thinking about, to be honest, of the way Boltansky would use wires hanging down from pictures from the Holocaust, right? And so we started kind of generating some of that to kind of weave and tie it all together. But these are really um, elaborate on, some of them are very elaborate ensemble pieces. This probably has 50, 50, yeah. 50 or more layers in it in Photoshop. And each little teeny individual image is something that was uh, generated with AI. So we're, we're owning it. We're upfront about it. Um, yes, I was 100 percent. Yeah, it's absolutely AI. But the thing is, is that a we didn't like the compositions that AI made. And, you know, we felt like they could be better. And also we just didn't feel like we owned it unless we did something with it beyond just, oh, look, I prompted and I have this cool image, um, which we do that on our Instagram page. So um, if you're interested in just the straight images, we we present those on our Instagram page. And so um, anyway, these are uh, we'll just talk about some of the other images that we've put together. This one's called True Believers. And. It's about science and lovers of science and believing in science and 
I think also believing that it will somehow find solutions to all these problems, right? And, um, you know, just to give you a sense, we couldn't get a, a winding staircase to heaven out of the AI prompts. So, you know, this piece right here is probably 10 images easily that are assembled. And this observatory might have been one of the hardest pieces that we ever assembled because we knew or ever prompted because we knew we wanted a long winding road and the um, the observatory back there. But we needed it to be at a certain perspective and we wanted it to be at night. And, you know, so there's lots of challenges to getting the the piece that you want for your composition. And we like to throw little uh, pie in the sky elements in like, or I should say Easter eggs in like this little girl is at a chalkboard and she's in the sky and it's pie in the sky. So there's lots of times little funny little nuggets in there for us as well. So. Anything you want to say about that? No, one? we're at five minutes, so we're going to honor that. Oh, are we at five? No, we're not at five minutes yet. You're are at we? four minutes, 20 seconds. Okay. Well, so we'll just run through some of these real quick. Then this one's called Submerged, and it's about global sea level or global sea rise. And this one's called Endemic, about uh, the, ep the uh, epidemic of loneliness. And this one's called Taming Tigers. Um I don't know what it has to do with technology. <laughs> this one's about bot farming. And this one is uh, called Sleep of Reason and how sometimes things seem so reasonable when you're thinking about them, but they're so futile and um, impossible at the same time. And of course, it's a reference to Goya and the Sleep of Reason produces monsters. The big... <laughs> fantastic thank you so much That's the last thank one you. thank you everyone and all the artwork has been so amazing wow, wow. we're such it's such an honor to be included yeah such great great artwork do we have any questions we've had a lot of great comments in the in the chat but i'm wondering if there are any questions for any of the artists we had planned for the talk to go to 6.30 um, and we have like 10 more minutes. So any questions, comments? You can unmute if you wanna just speak. Any of the artists have observations about? <clears throat> I think it's, work. this has been an amazing show. My name is Jane Gottlieb. I'm so impressed with how far all of these artists have gone beyond photography and created their new, and uh, each one has a new art form that's their unique form and vision and really creative vision. I'm very inspired by this group. I, I thank you for doing this and including me in the show. Thank you. Yeah, it's, um, I, I go back to what Douglas said in the beginning. It's such an exciting time in photography um, with the, all the ways that people are making work, you know, photo-based work. And, and, and I, I love, um, you know, this, I'm with Douglas, like I, I love all the things that people are doing and the way that people are incorporating all the different techniques from different decades and, um, and so, yeah, it's very exciting. And, and you're right. There's so many of the artists in the show are, are doing that and That's great. It makes it really exciting. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just say that I'll, I'll repeat the comment that I love the whole shaggy beast of photography and I'll, 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 I'll attribute it to it was that whole, that phrase, the whole shaggy beast. I love the whole shaggy beast was John Sarkowski, who was the curator of photography at the Museum of Modern Art for years. And he, at some point, somebody asked him, well, what, you know, what do you, what do you love? And he just listed the long quote is like everything. He listed everything from, you know, street photography to col new color to photograms. I mean, it goes on and on and on. And then he pauses and says, I love the whole shaggy beast. <laughs> it is a shaggy beast. It's very shaggy these days. And so this <laughs> whole group, obviously everybody who's, is spoken exploring different aspects of shagginess you know I, I love it yeah now only yeah it, i love that well, next time we'll see an image somewhere and we'll say that's absolutely shaggy 
<laughs> or somebody right now is putting the phrase shaggy beast into AI, right? Into, you know, right. <laughs> and seeing what, see what you get. You can do it in five minutes, right? <laughs> we had a shaggy beast in the last image. <laughs> <laughs> You know, when you mentioned Robert Heineken, I thought about how he talked about there was already enough photographs in the world and <laughs> he could just, you know, he just used other people's. And um, I thought, what would he think of AI? I know. He'd probably be like, great, man. That's the ultimate version. Yeah. He would just go crazy. Yeah. There's a German photographer. I can't remember their name right now who said no more photographs until the old ones are used up. And I've always, <laughs> I've always loved that, you know, I don't know, we're looking at various people who are collaging, Dominique, you know, I mean, you're using a, a self-portrait and then photographs of artifacts or blankets and so on, but essentially you're like using and reusing your own photograph. So the idea of, you know, we have enough photographs and no more new ones until the old ones are used up. That kind of captures a part of the shaggy beast of the moment. Um, I feel like there's a haiku in here somewhere. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> so in any event. Well, it's been it's been a lovely evening. Um, thank you so much, everyone. I just I really love these um these virtual receptions and just being able to hear everyone talk and see the work and 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 you know understand the artists even deeper. Um also, if you go to the the um, page on our website, all of the artists that have websites, their names are linked to their websites. So you can go and you can look through and get uh, more in depth about the you know different bodies of work that they have and 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 all of that. So um, I, I encourage you to do that. And again, thank you so much for being here. Thank you to all the artists. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you um, and um, and to the audience, thank you for, for, um, for being here tonight. And um, hopefully we'll see you at the next event. Thank you, it was wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks to everybody. Thank you, bye-bye.